How is everyone today? Good. Not hungover? Because this isn't DEF CON, of course. <laughs> All right. Just so you know, my name is Joe, Average Joe, and I'm going to be doing a talk on bypassing FireEye. Does anyone know what FireEye is? All right, about half of you. All right, for those of you who don't know, it's a very, very expensive anti-malware appliance. If you don't have millions of dollars to blow on it, you're not going to see it. That means Fortune 1000 companies, Fortune 500 companies that actually have the green to actually blow on IT will use, will look at this product as kind of like a, a panacea, like a fix-all. Of course, if you're in security, you know that's bullshit. So I'm curious, though, because FireEye is in California. I think they're in Modesto or something like that. Is anyone here from FireEye? <laughs> Liar. All right, here's what we're going to be going over. A little about FireEye, malware today, four bypasses and fixes. Well, technically 4.5 because one of them is only half. And ideas for the future, can we fix it, and wrap it up. All right, what is FireEye and why is it considered the best? It's a sandbox. It's an, intrusion it's an intrusion detection system. It's not an intrusion prevention system. It's just a detection system. What else I put there? It's, they claim it's a disassembler, but I think that's BS because I can't get the uh, results to show out. It's a dependency walker. It's a sniffer. It's a pseudo heuristic analysis engine, but we'll get into that more in, in just a sec. Moving on, though. Malware today is delivered in three stages. Typically, the exploit, or tricking some dumbass to click on your, pro on your program. Then a downloader. Then part three is usually command and control server, an info bot, maybe something that steals credentials, something like that. FireEye and McAfee and all the other products that go along with it will usually only catch stage Three. Once in a while, you get them to catch stage two. Stage one, if they're going off of uh, signature-based analysis, like taking a hash of a file. But as we've all seen, all you have to do is change one single byte, one byte, and the whole thing is completely different. All right, so this is what a typical stage one looks like. I know it's kind of hard to see, but this is an actually a Java exploit. I'm going to move over here if this will let me, and it won't. So I just talking it. Yeah, enough about that. <laughs> All right, your typical stage one is a Java exploit. I don't know if you can see that. If you can't, I'm sorry, but I will be offering slides. It's a Java exploit that takes advantage of the security manager exploit. One that this one guy I know that works at AccuVant, J Duck. I don't know if you've ever had the privilege of meeting him. Be huge drunk, but great guy. Like him. <laughs> it. Uh, what it does is it attacks the security manager. It invokes the security manager object in such a way that lets you elevate privileges and run code. In this particular case, it's heavily obfuscated. The reason why, the reason why antiviruses and FireEye don't see this is because it changes so much. All right, what does a stage two look like? Typically, you won't see a stage two. A stage two is just a downloader. All the downloader does is download other programs, other malicious things, something along the lines of, say, I don't know, got a command and control bot, a Bitcoin miner, something that steals your passwords, something like that. This is what a stage three looks like. In IDA, the best program ever, this kind of looks like, uh, I don't know, Maybe something out of a nuclear reactor, but that's just the switch statement for the main function main right there. Look at all that. It's crazy. That's what a stage three looks like. All righty then. All right, so what malware out there already bypasses FireEye? Have you ever heard of zero access before? No one? All right, one person. All right, one person who probably works in my industry knows what zero access is. Zero access and the nuclear exploit pack, a little bit of what an exploit pack is essentially is a program, a special kit, like a special web page that's 
contains everything. It contains a detector. It contains a plug-in detector. It contains the exploit. It contains everything. Someone, a, a tiny iframe somewhere on some page, hundreds, thousands of hack pages will have these little tiny iframes that point to a specific page. The exploit kit will detect, what it'll do is it'll detect the program. It'll detect what's running. After detecting what's running, it will then send an exploit at it. After, which was, which is that stage one I just saw. After detecting the stage one, it will then do the downloader. After doing the downloader, then you'll get your command control. The most popular one right now is the nuclear exploit pack. It's really effective. It's really hard to see. And we only usually see it after stage three. Ah, black hole. We're actually, I actually heard that guy was uh, arrested. They actually somehow managed to track down the guy, beat him up, and say, stop it. Very little details. It's out of Russia, our good friends in Russia. All right. The reason why zero access seems to bypass FireEye, from what I've seen, is they already employ the same techniques I'm about to go over. There's rootkit activity. And we do, we've known about zero access for a long time. We've known about it since about 2011. The zero access exploit, or the zero access botnet, at one point had 9 million machines under its control. That's a lot. They were just using it for stupid stuff. Denial of service, mining bitcoins. Actually, that's pretty good. I wish I could mine a whole bunch of bitcoins. All right. FireEye, it does stop some of them, but it doesn't stop all of zero access. In fact, if FireEye didn't detect if, if zero access didn't use a known command and control server because it only uses like a few of them, if it used several thousand of them, FireEye just wouldn't see it. So presently right now, FireEye, whenever it detects zero access, it will only see the callback. Since FireEye is a network sniffer, it will see the callback and that's it. It doesn't see, it doesn't see stage one, it doesn't see stage two, it sees stage three purely because it called back out to some other site it, it, knew, it knows in a list that is bad. All right, so how does it do it? Method one, bypass method one, intrinsic functions. Any of you who, any of you who are really good with C, this is your thing. Inline assembly is your best friend ever. FireEye will flag binaries checking for certain Win32 Win API calls. And the way around that is to use inline assembly. Because This is because FireEye, like I said in my previous slide, actually uses a dependency walker. A dependency walker is just a program that watches what other programs do. It will actually go right down to the base level operating system level code. Like, say for example, a call to I don't know, message box. We know that's in user32.dll. By going a step lower than that, using inline assembly, we can actually bypass the entire dependency walker check. All right, so in this particular case, I'm using three different, three different low-level calls to uh, checking for the presence of a debugger. FireEye will flag any binary that calls the standard is debugger present Win32 ABI. But if we use inline assembly, it doesn't see it. And here are three, I, I know it's kind of hard to read, but here are three different methods I've scoured over the internet for checking for the presence of a debugger. Unfortunately, I can't really show you the pictures of FireEye just not seeing it. The company I work for, they're really anal about that. They're like, no, don't, don't show that. If you want to keep your job, don't show the screenshots. But that's life in corporate, right? First function right here, get Git being debugged, I believe that checks the process environment block, checks for a certain a certain bit that's set. Another one, get NT global flags, I believe that checks another bit that's set or some flag or another. But the idea is all these functions, a lot of the functions, a lot of functionality, actually, you can actually do an inline assembly call too, and just skip the process and skip the actual dependency walker altogether. So the key here is, in order to bypass FireEye, go low, go deep. Method two, sleeping. Here I have my sleeping giraffe. I think that's called a joey. Is that a joey? Maybe that's a goat. Maybe that, yeah, maybe it's a kangaroo. Maybe I should have gotten that. That's a Jeffrey? That's cool. 
Okay, any dependency walker worth its weight in salt will see the Win32 API call sleep. A little bit, a little bit about FireEye. It actually has a VMware. It has a sandbox VM image. Whenever it actually sees anything new, anything downloaded, and it thinks it's a, and it thinks it's a virus, what it'll do is it'll run it through its little sandbox environment, testing to, testing for certain things, certain malicious activity. Going back to its whole heuristic scanner. One thing, the first thing you'll notice about FireEye is actually is its de default timeout. It default times out to five minutes. If you can sleep longer than five minutes without actually letting your, without letting the dependency walker know you're sleeping, FireEye won't see it and it'll just say it's legitimate. It could be the most messed up program out there. It could be a horrible virus. It could be something that steals all the credit card numbers. It could be something that just changes the background of poop. It won't see it if you sleep longer than five minutes. Of course, you can actually set the timeout higher, but most, most of the time, all my other analysts, they just do five minutes. And there's no real reason to not do more than five minutes because if you don't see the, see the sleep call, what's the point? I don't have all day. I got a hundred other things to do. All right, so here's my code. I try to blow it up as much as possible. I'm using sleep, using inline assembly once again inline assembly in C, master race. I'm using a little function called the RDTST function, read date timestamp. It's actually a low level, in, it's a low level assembly instruction. All it, does, it pretty much does the same thing as get tick count. What it does is it's, it grabs every single tick, every single cycle that's gone on since the uh, machine was first booted up. What I'm doing is I'm using it to actually determine how long it's been since the since the last cycle, and I'm using that as a sort of a, a comparison to sleep. It works. Fire, I didn't see it. I don't know why they would, but they didn't see it. All right, next method. Go deeper. Observation. Out of the box, FireEye being as great as being as great as it is, it only goes two layers deep. Two. That's it. Inside of a zip file. A zip file instead of a zip file. That's it. That's where it stops. I took a piece of malware. I knew it was a piece of malware. I grabbed it from some source. I don't remember where. Probably one of my friends. I, I uploaded it to Virus Total. It had 48 out of 48. Everyone knew what it was. I put it three layers deep inside of a, a zip entry. So a zip inside of a zip inside of a zip. Fire I stopped. It's like, I'm not going any further. Forget that. Another friend over here, this gentleman with the Finch shirt, he suggested something like a, a zip bomb. I haven't tested that yet. Don't know why I would. All right, so here's our proof. This is one of the few images I was able to uh, sneak past my company just by redacting just about everything. See, funny story about FireEye. They were actually able to determine the company I worked at by that MD5 hash right there where it says redacted, sorry. Someone actually spent the time to type out an MD5 hash and look it up in a database saying, oh, yeah, I know where you work at. Then they snitched to my director. Good job. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So I do have a fix for this one. We can actually make FireEye go more than two layers deep. At my company, I make it go 20 layers deep, because why not? But then again, who's going to go more than 20 layers? Well, probably one of you guys now, now that you know. <laughs> All right, there's, so there's two, there's two real settings. Inside the actual config console, which I, once again, I tried to produce a screenshot, but once again, it was redacted by my company, so that's fine, whatever. It's called malware analyze config archive. Yeah, it's, it's really long. Bypass method four, detect the VM. FireEye will run suspected binaries, as I just said, through its own VM sandbox in an attempt to determine its functionality. It does this with a little dependency walker that runs on the side. If you are able to detect the presence of a VM and immediately exit, this will bypass the sandbox. Pretty simple. Problem is, they don't really tell you anything about what kind of VM they use. So I can only make determinate guesses. I know they're not using Hyper-V because Microsoft sucks. I know, I think they're actually using OpenVM or what's it called? What's that Oracle product? 
VirtualBox, that's it. That's what I think they're using. I know they use their own custom hypervisor, but I think they base it off of that because it's open source. And if you're lazy, that's what you do. You rip off other people. <laughs> All right, so right here I have some more inline assembly and C, because it's awesome. I also have the picture from, I think that's some Druid game. It's a really old game I haven't played in a while. First function here, inline assembly, checking for the presence of a VM. On your left, we have uh, some inline assembly code, and what it is doing is trying to check the input-output ports. In, it's using hardware ports to try and determine is this a VM or not. It's, it's kind of highly technical, and I don't want to get into it too far. If you actually talk to me after this, I have to save on some time. Second one is the uh, classic red pill. I don't know if you ever read into that, but we'll get into that later. Method 4.5, technically five, but not quite. Most sandboxes and VMs are very frugal with their RAM, very frugal. Have you ever been to uh, malware.com, M-A-L-W-A-R.com or whatever it is? I would imagine after serving thousands and thousands of people, they probably have like default images that are really small. Like what's the default? If you strip down XP, how much, I mean, how much RAM do you really need? I mean, I had an old box. I only needed 128 megs of RAM to run XP. It was slow, but it still worked. So I would imagine it's only like 512 or 256. My detection method, my detection method is to check to see if they have less than a gig of RAM. Because today, really, who doesn't have a gig of RAM? I have a gig of RAM on my phone that's two years old. Seriously. So my detection method is to check to see how much RAM they have. And if they're not, use that as part of a determinant to check to see if you're inside of a VM. It's kind of stupid. But then again, if I have a bot, I want it to be powerful. I don't really care, if I don't really care about machines that are less than a gig. So we're taking advantage of that. I guess another thing you could do is check to see if it only has one processor core, but that's, once again, same thing. Can we fix it? I really like this GIF. <laughs> Staying up to date with current malware trends is the tried and true method. Attending my talk, that's a great first step. I like to say there is no panacea fix all. Humans should always be in the loop. One of my coworkers was telling me about how in the future there's not going to be any security analysts or malware analysts. They're just going to have FireEye to do everything for them. That's the way they have it set up. All you have to do is uh, FireEye will actually act like a pager, let you know, hey, this product's infected. You feed it in your sim stream, says, hey, this might be infected. All right, so reimage it. Uh, how did it get infected? No one cares. Just reimage it. My job, I'll always have a job is to determine, all right, how did it get in? Why did it get in? How do I stop it? Other ideas. This stuff isn't really related to FireEye, but it's more along those same lines of, uh, of an actual Sandware VM box, something like that. Sandbox VMware, blah. In my code here, what I'm actually doing is, is that what I decided? Yeah, that's what I decided on. I actually had two pieces. I chose this one last minute. The first idea was actually to call out to a site and check to see if I was online. Because a lot of VMware boxes, what they'll do is they'll actually disable the internet or they'll enable the internet and they'll just edit the host file to whatever you think. So a page might say google.com when in actuality it's not. So my idea was what if you get like a hash or something? Get like a hash of the fave icon. If the fave icon hashes don't match, then you're probably inside of a sandbox and you, should, you just shouldn't run. But I didn't go with that. In this particular case, this idea falls back on sleeping. Once again, no one, a lot of uh, Trojans out there, when they run, they immediately run. It's like they don't have time. Most people, when they're on their computer, and they're, they're not on there for two minutes. They're on there for hours. You know, it's their job. Or they're browsing Facebook or whatever. In this particular case, I say wait longer before executing. This goes back to the parable of the Trojan horse. You've all heard about the uh, Trojan. Everyone knows what a Trojan horse is, of course. But the history behind it was when the uh, people, they hid inside the Trojan horse, did they uh, pop out immediately and just get slaughtered? No, they waited until nighttime before actually coming out and doing their dastardly deeds. I like that word, dastardly. All right. 
So in this particular code right here, I've actually determined how to, to how to tell when the machine is about to be either A, logged off, or B, about to be shut down. There's actually a small window of opportunity to, log, to launch your code when the program shuts, when the computer shuts down. So that's all, that, that's all I'm really exploiting here. Win32 hooks, same thing I use for uh, key loggers. You just find the, find the particular window message that's executed when the computer shuts down and use that as your event. Real easy. Well, actually not. The future of malware. This is always an interesting subject. There will be more of it in the future. We know there's money involved, billions of it, billions of dollars in this malware stuff. That said, it's going to be a lot more sophisticated. Going back to what I said before, I will always have a job. Always. And one, one thing is for certain, well, maybe, I, I'm not sure. I'd like to see more encryption, but I'm not really seeing it. But this is kind of like a, maybe I'll see more encryption. Most of the time, it's always packed. I'm going to see a lot more sophisticated packers, memory-based packers. Um, I don't know if you saw the talk yesterday about that one guy doing the uh, anti-ROP. Essentially, he just wrote a packer. I'm going to see more stuff like that. Questions? Or do you just want to look at the animation? That's fine, too. I know, it's really interesting, isn't it? It's just vaporizing. Questions? Anyone? No one? When, uh, when FireEye detects malware in the sandbox, does it just destroy the sandbox immediately? No. What it'll do is it'll continue to execute and try and give you like an output of what it did exactly, what places it contacted, stuff like that. Does it have network connectivity? It does. So could you malware infect your own FireEye to look at it? You could. Yeah, you could. It's just hard to actually, unless you're actually inside FireEye itself and using something like snapshot mode, like just a little mini video, you wouldn't actually get any output. You. Visual Studio 6? No, I use Visual Studio 2010. What's that have to do with anything? Oh, no, I use Pell's C compiler, smorgasbord. Great thing. Anyone else? I would have hoped I had more t more questions, but I guess not. Hold on, hold on, hold on, wait, 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 wait. I get some free advertising here, so I might as well take advantage of it, right? I'm always doing this kind of stuff in my free time, so please see my stupid website, gironsec.com slash blog, for all this uh, great information on all the malware stuff I like to research. And yeah, the, the least intelligent comment of all time at the end. I just had to say that. All right, now you can clap. Oh, and uh, it's lunchtime now, so go eat food.